The German ethnologist Eberhard Fischer and the Indian artist and cultural anthropologist Aku Shah received permission from the family and the three Bhagats, the priests and ritual specialists, to document the four-day death ritual. The morning of the cremation day started with a ceremony for the dead body inside the house. Around 10, the corpse was brought out and placed on the bamboo bier. A pot with a straw handle was kept by its side. Two men stood apart, playing a tur drum and a metal plate. Women, all wailing, poured out of the house along with the dead body. Two men swiftly lifted the beer and proceeded towards the river. The women followed the body down the slope and then stayed behind while the men went on, loudly lamenting the loss of the deceased. When the men reached the river, the body was laid down on the dry riverbed. A high pile of wood was erected on a small plot of land jutting out into the river. The lowest layer of the pyre consisted of pieces of the trunk of a tree which had been cut the same day. The big logs were spread crosswise and on top of them smaller branches were placed. Finally, the men topped the pile with branches with fresh green leaves. The corpse was brought to the pyre and taken around it four times. The beer was lifted close to the top edge of the pyre, the ropes were untied, and from the slanting beer, the body was shifted across onto the pile of wood. The white cloth was adjusted to cover the entire body. The face of the dead was uncovered and the turban cloth fixed properly. Two thick silver rings became visible. A lead bangle adorned his wrist. A piece of cloth was rinsed in the river and the face of the dead sprinkled and washed with the water. One by one, the male family members came to the pile, climbed up by the headside and, standing behind the body, fed the dead man with boiled rice, sugarcane wine and water. Now from all sides the men got up and came to the pyre with tufts of branches which they had brought from their homes as their contribution to the cremation. One man approached the pyre and tore off a strip of the covering cloth of the corpse. With this small piece of cloth, the silver ornaments, the axe head and the pot, this man circled the pyre four times. Then he smashed the pot. This was the sign for the son of the deceased to take the fire and to light the pyre. Now many more men came and added fire to the pyre. Immediately after the pyre had caught fire, all the men went down to the river, got undressed and started bathing. When coming out, they sprinkled some water with the right hand onto the boulders. Then they started washing their clothes and then dried them on the shore. The pyre took three hours to burn out. Two young men stood in the river, ladling water with their hands onto the ground of the pyre, while a third swept the ashes off the ground into the river by using a broom. With this act, the cremation day ended.
On the second day, around noon, ceremonies began again inside the house. One hour later, suddenly everyone rushed through the door. One man carried the basket with the food, one the grass, and one the pot. They stopped once when they had reached the field. Here one plate of food was placed on the ground. Only the men proceeded to the river. Women stood around wailing. One old woman embraced a loudly weeping woman to prevent her from following the men. The son of the deceased, who was leading the group, started weeping when he saw the river, and he went on crying until he reached the shore. All the men took a bath in the river. Somewhat away from the cremation ground, at a quiet spot, the bundle with the food basket was opened. Two leaf plates with food were transferred to the bed of leaves which had been spread out on the cremation site. The food was taken in the basket and placed onto the head of the brother of the deceased. With another man, he went into the water to plunge the food. They then came back with the empty basket, only to return a second time to the river to sink also the basket. In the meantime, two older men fetched the Jambuda branches from the ground and dipped them into the water. The brother of the deceased took the two branch bundles and was asked to stand on the cremation ground facing the river. He then had to hold the leaf branches behind his back. He suddenly dropped both bundles and they fell at the spot where the feet of the corpse had been placed on the pyre. The water pot, filled with river water, was brought to the man. He held it and sprinkled some water on the ground, walking around the cremation site. Then the man had to stand on the branches facing the fields, while another man encircled him, sprinkling rice grains on the ground. One man started to clean the ground with branches, while other men stood in the river, ladling water onto the ground. All the food was thus washed into the river. The men started to build the Mandavo canopy. Six branches, with short bifurcations at the top, were stuck into the ground, forming two rows. Three additional sticks were placed horizontally over the forkings, and three or four fresh branches, which were bent in their middle, were placed over them, thus forming a roof. Long grass blades were now laid as a thick layer over them. Nine men stood in a row. The food was lifted up by one man and passed on to the next. In this manner, the food on the leaf plates reached the Mandavo canopy where it was placed around the pot. The brother of the deceased now sat in front of the Mandavo facing the river and offered food to the pot with his two hands. Then he got up while another man took a sickle and cut a small indentation into the lip of the earthen pot. Then all men left the Mandavo. They went to bathe in the river. Forty minutes later, four or five prepared in the field ditches for two fireplaces under a grove of trees and then made tea for all. Tea leaves, gur, sugar molasses and water were boiled together in large vessels. All mourners climbed up from the riverbed and sat in the shade, relaxed and smoking. Men and boys came from different directions of the neighborhood, carrying on their shoulder baskets wrapped in white cloth. The baskets were untied and placed in the center in a curved line around the teapots. In only one basket, there was cooked tuva pulses. 
two men took a long white cloth and spread it, holding it up like a hammock, while another man emptied the baskets into it. Thus, the pulse from the different households was mixed and then poured back into the baskets. All this time, turdrum was played in the background. Before the food was served, all the family members and the two bhagats who were present made an offering of some food on the ground. This was accompanied by the following utterances by the men. May this reach to my ancestors. I offer them. Some baskets were selected and packed with food to be taken to the women who had stayed in the house. Now every man received a single kakra leaf, out of which each person prepared his own cup. Afterwards, food was distributed around. One of the older men said, Kaya, eat. And only then did everybody start eating. One hour later, suddenly and unexpectedly, the Bhagat Chamario went into trance. He entered the circle, walking on all fours, and crawled twice around the food offerings. He trembled heavily, shaking his head. After a short while, he was caught and tightly gripped by a man, while water was poured on his face and, guided by some hands, drizzled into his mouth. Soon he calmed down, washed his arms and face with water, and quietly drank some tea. Finally, someone said, Get your baskets. The vessels were cleaned, and each man took the basket and vessels belonging to his household and went home. Early in the morning, a few relatives of the deceased had come from Ranveri to Valod, the neighboring town, to purchase two gumats, terracotta domes, at the house of the potter. While the calabash clarinet was played, the two domes were carried to the cart and lifted up onto the hay and fastened there with a thick rope. The clarinet player started again to play then he sat down in front of the cart, next to the driver, and the cart started moving back to Ranveri. After a day of rest, the fourth day began again in the deceased's house. Kakadiya Bhagat started the ceremony by taking off his shirt. He yawned and began slightly to tremble. Then he took up small quantities of rice on his middle finger while chanting some words very quickly. He counted the grains. There were three, so he was satisfied. Next, Kakadiya placed the tali, a metal plate with the rice, between his knees and took some grains in his hand. He took a ten paisa coin in his right hand to insert it under the rice. He formed a small rice heap on top of the coin, which he pressed hard with his right hand fingers. After watching the result, whether the grains remained in a heap on the coin or not, he threw the rice down from the coin and back onto his palm. Finally, the heap was placed on a fresh leaf, he wrapped all into a cloth and placed this near the burning cow dung cake. There it was opened, checked, tied again, and then taken out of the house. A large and a small stone were handed over to Kakadiya Bhagat. At this time, the women started crying and weeping very loudly. With the large stone placed in front of him, Kakadiya said after some time, after coming in trance, I will call the Katru, spirit. After a short smoking interval, Kakadiya Bhagat yawned and started trembling. Manyo Bhagat trembled as well. Then the stone was handed over to Kakadiya, who took it and turned it around. Kakadiya Bhagat took a sickle and picked with its tip a circle around the stone into the floor. 
He went with the sickle tip over the large stone, making strokes. Fire sparks surfaced, a sign that there is life within the stone and ascertaining that the soul of the deceased will accept it as a body. The blackish stone pebble was washed, while Kakadia prepared a rough brush out of a branch. Color was prepared from vermilion and milk mixed in a leaf bowl. Kakadia Bagat now started drawing a figure composed of short lines. He started with the top, sketching sun and moon, placing underneath the shaft of the body, to which he added head, arms and legs. The pebble has become a hatru, a soul stone. With this done, the Bhagats placed the stone at the central pillar of the house. To infuse the life of a living being into the stone, a hen was brought into the house. Her neck was cut with a sickle, blood sprinkled over the stone. The silver ornaments of the deceased were brought and put onto the stone. In this moment, the Bhagat searches for the soul of the deceased, sending out his own breath as wind during his trance to find the wandering soul of the dead with the request to the soul to come and take possession of the stone, its new body. The soul stone with the ornaments were shifted in a basket from the house to the field. The son of the dead man had to stand in front of the stone. Facing the stone, he held two small leaf bowls in his hands. Behind him, his male relatives were sitting. In front of the stone, the young brother of the deceased squatted down. He offered food and water to the ground. Then liquor and tea were offered to the stone and all adult men received drinks also. The stone had been brought inside the house again. A second clarinet player had joined. Kakadia Bagat went into trance for a short while and offered leaves, grain and liquor to the soul stone. He stretched out his arms to touch the stone on its top with his closed fist. The women started crying again loudly. Both clarinets were played with full vigor. Hearing this, many men entered the house to embrace the Bhagats one by one. They squatted down, placed their hands on the shoulders of the priest and bent their hands then towards the cheek of the priest. Some youngsters came forward before the women got up to embrace the Bhagats. The women first washed their hands with water, then gave coins to the Bhagats and silently embraced them. They jointly gave rice to the women into their right hands uttering some words. About half an hour later, food was brought. Some more rice was now moistened with milk, out of which Kakadia made small lumps in his fists. He kept such lumps in both his hands while he stretched his arms towards the soul stone. His two forefingers now touched the head of the painted figure on the pebble. In the meantime, some men had placed the vessels with food and tea on the ground at the entrance of the house. All the men sat down in a circle. Liquor in different bottles and in a jug was brought from the neighborhood and mixed in a pot out of which everyone was served. Even the small boys received a sip. After lunch, the Bhagat Kakadia was tired and left for his home. It was around three in the afternoon when a few men and women rushed out of the house. The men started dancing in a small circle in front of the house. Among them, a man with a basket in which the soul stone was kept, another one with a food basket, the two clarinet players and the Bhagat Manyo carrying a stick. The women stood at the entrance crying and weeping. Then the group left together with the bullock cart with the two Gumat domes for the grove of Ranveri village. When they arrived there, some people had started to search for a proper place where the two new Gumats could be installed. 
women and men, assembled near the domes of the deceased man's family. There were many uncovered stone pebbles stuck into the ground. The men now engaged in a discussion about which soul stone belonged to whom, and therefore should be lifted and now be placed under the new domes. Twelve stones were taken out of the ground. After having decided on the actual site for the two gumats, some men brought one terracotta dome to measure out the exact ground space required for the two domes. Then, at both places, the circles were dug out with a long iron rod. Inside this deepened circular outline, the newly painted soul stone was fixed in the ground along with some small flags and the other stones of the family were stuck next to it. To prove the strength and durability of the gumats, the old man Manyo, supporting himself with the stick and helped by two younger men, slowly climbed up on a gumat and uneasily took a few steps around its top. Then Manyo paid a visit to the wooden crocodile at the other end of the grove. Now the two domes were shifted to cover the soul stones and the accompanying flags. One man sprinkled water all over the place while Manyo threw grains of rice all over the grove. Liquor and chicken meat were also offered inside the opening of the gumat. Then the small terracotta door was put in place and a hanging root of a banyan tree was used as a rope to wind around the dome. Men, women and children sat together in a large circle in front of the sanctuary, awaiting the bottles of beverages which were brought from the neighborhood. This final event was the first occasion that men, women and children joined together for a feast.